Warm welcome to this series entitled Solid Foundations. This is talk nine, and uh, during the first eight sessions, we've looked at the biggest story of the Bible. We've said it's a story from creation in Genesis to a new creation in Revelation. And we've talked about how you can only properly understand the smaller stories, the individual books and verses of the Bible, in the context of this whole story. If we don't understand the larger narrative of the whole Bible, then even Jesus' life, death and resurrection don't make sense. They only make sense in the context of God's overall story and his purpose for his creation. It's crucial that you understand why God made us and put us on this earth in the first place so that we can understand how Jesus is the hero who rescues and redeems the story. You see, God through Jesus is restoring us to our original position and our commission. We were created in the image of, and likeness of God for a relationship with him and a role to play on earth. In, in session one, right back in the beginning, we learned that God created us for a relationship at four different levels, with God, with himself, with ourselves, with others, and with the earth. Each of these areas was damaged by sin at the fall, but through Jesus' death and resurrection, he brings restoration and healing to each of these four relational levels. In these last four sessions, and this series that we're doing, we're going to look at what it looks like to live in a spiritually healthy way. And it shouldn't surprise us to realize that to be truly spiritually healthy, all four of these relational areas need to be functioning as God intended and designed them to be. We're going to learn over the next four sessions that when we're living in a right relationship with God in each of these four areas, we're actually living fully human as God intended us to live. The life that Jesus came to give us, a life that pleases God, a healthy spiritual life, has both a vertical connection and a horizontal outworking. One has to do with our relationship with God, and the other has to do with the impact it has on our life and our relationships with people and the world around us. You see, the depth of our relationship with God at the vertical level, level is actually marked by what happens on the horizontal level. The Bible is very clear that we can't have a relationship with God who is unseen that isn't evidenced by what you can see on earth. A healthy spiritual life is witnessed in these four relational areas that we started our series with. It starts, first of all, with a passionate devotion to God and a growing desire to know him better. Jesus said, you must love the Lord your God with all of your heart and all of your soul and all of your mind. Then secondly, this should then result in an increasing transformation of my life that reflects the person and the character of Christ. You see, when we draw near to God, we cannot remain the same. It will change us. It's intended to change us. And then thirdly, this is evidenced by a deeper commitment to others, especially those in our church community. The Bible again says we cannot love God without loving his physical body on earth. And lastly, it's witnessed by our practical engagement with the lost and the broken world around me. Again, you cannot love God and not love people in the world and seek their redemption, which will also involve addressing some of the systems of this world that don't reflect God's heart for humanity. That's God's call for us. And that's what a healthy spiritual life looks like. All four aspects are important because they've been redeemed through Jesus' death and his resurrection. In the time that we've got left this session, 
we're going to cover a vertical relationship with God. It's the first and key relationship that Jesus came to restore. Jesus said in Matthew 22, in verse 37, he said, You must love the Lord your God with all of your heart and all of your soul and all of your mind. Our relationship with God should be marked by a passionate devotion to God and a growing desire to know him better and better. But the key is that it actually starts by you, by us realizing that he first loved us. Because if we're honest, it's hard to feel devoted to or love someone that you feel distant to or is disinterested in you or is angry at you. You can be, I think about this, you can be amazed at the creative ability of God. You can be in awe of his power and majesty, and, and we should be, but I believe you can only truly love God when you experience him as a loving father. It needs more than just being in awe of him or being impressed with his power. You need to experience him as a loving father. You see, Jesus referred to God using this term Father, Abba, is the word. It's, it's a word that was used by Jewish children towards their fathers. And it's actually best translated Papa or Daddy. Th this was blasphemy. This was a, 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 a blasphemous term to the religious Jew to use this term for God. It was forbidden. But one of the things that sets Christianity apart from Judaism, in fact, that sets it apart from all other world religions, is that Jesus taught us we could address Almighty God as Abba, Father. In fact, Christianity is the only world religion that teaches you can have a personal relationship with God as a loving Father. You can know personally your loving Father. He's not some distant deity. He's not some mighty force just up there in the universe. He is your father, your loving father. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 6 and verse 18, this, he says, talking about God, I will be a father to you and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. You see, our love of God can take on a far deeper level than simply honour or awe or respect. You can know God intimately as your loving Heavenly Father. And that's what Jesus intends for you to do. He came to redeem your relationship with the Father so that you could know Him in amazing and intimate ways. You are created by God and are loved by Him and have been given a free will so that you can respond and return your love to him. Saint Augustine said this, he said, You formed us, O God, for yourself, and our hearts are restless till they find rest in you. Now you may suppress it, you may even deny that, that God has given you this desire to respond to his love and worship him. But it's in every one of us. It's part of our DNA. There's never been a, a race of humanity dis, um, discovered that hasn't had some form of worshipping God. This, this inbuilt ability inside each one of us to look to God and worship him. But the truth is many people, particularly men, struggle with this concept of loving God and worshipping him. So why does God tell us to love and worship him? God doesn't need our affirmation for his self-worth. He, he, he's not looking for us to build him up in any way. He doesn't need our self-affirmation towards him. He calls us to worship him. Well, first of all, the word worship, it, it, it means to ascribe value to something. But it also has this meaning of drawing near to or close to in a relationship. You see, God calls us to worship him because he knows that as human beings created in his image and likeness, we will ascribe value to something or someone. And when we do, the thing that we ascribe value to begins to shape 
and influence our life. We draw near to it. So God tells us to value him, value him above other things and value him instead of other things. You see, when we get our relationship with God right, when God becomes the person of value that we place at the center of our life, the Bible tells us, the scriptures tell us that the rhythm of our life then flows as we were designed to. Our soul prospers and it has an overflow effect on others around us. Jesus said this, he said, seek the kingdom of God first and then all of that other stuff that you're looking for and trying to make a priority, all of that stuff will fall into its rightful place when you seek the kingdom of God first. But he said when something else becomes the center of our life, when we put something else at the top of our life, when we ascribe value, top value to something else, it becomes our God. And when we worship it, our life falls out of the rhythm that God created us to be in. Proverbs verse three, uh, chapter 3 and verse 6 says this. It says, In everything you do, put God first, and he will direct you and crown your efforts with success. Love that verse. But I want you to see two things in this verse. There is a principle and a promise. The promise is God's bit. The principle is our bit. It's the habit that we must cultivate. Every time God gives you a promise, there is always a principle. The promise is you will succeed and your efforts will have success. If, if you want to succeed and you want to make sure that your efforts in every part of life have success, then God says there's a principle that you must put in place. And the principle that he tells, about, tells us about for this one is put God first. Ascribe top value to him. Not just in some things, but in everything you do. So that when I apply the principle, the habit of putting God first in everything I do, the promise then applies. He will direct me and crown my efforts with success. So what does it mean to put God first? How, how, do, we, how do you do that? What does it look like? Well, it doesn't mean first on a descending list. God first, spouse second, family third, walk, work fourth, church fifth, so on, so on. It, it, life just doesn't work like that. You know, if you worked on a descending list, you'd put God first, spouse second, then there'd be problems there because your spouse was second, and then you'd have no time for family or work or church or whatever. Just, it, just as it, life does not work that way. A verse says, in everything you do, put God first. Probably a better way of understanding it in our modern world today is to put God at the center of everything that you do. When you put God at the center of everything you do, you can expect that God will bless the rest. When, when you give God first in everything you do, it, it somehow becomes like, like an illustration I like to use is like it's like a seed that you're planting in an investment in the fertile garden of God's kingdom. And when you plant that seed, putting God first, it multiplies in every area that you sow it. When you give him the first of your time, he somehow multiplies the time that you have so that you can get more achieved than you ever thought possible before. When you give him the first of your week to worship and rest, somehow you have the ability to achieve more and feel more rested in your soul than if you filled your whole week with just your busy schedule. See, Proverbs 10 and verse 27 says this, I love it. Reverence for God adds ass to each day. It's the same when you give him the first part of your finances. Somehow your budget stretches far beyond what you thought capable on just your own resources. 
Proverbs 3 and verse 9 says this, Honour the Lord by giving him the first part of your income and he will fill your barns to overflowing. The, the first and the most important habit you need to develop in your life if you want to succeed in every area of your life is to love God and put him at the centre of everything that you do. That's how our vertical relationship with God is designed to work. Next session, we'll look at the first part of our relationship on the vertical level, our relationship with ourselves. Thanks for tuning in today, and I hope you'll find this session helpful for your daily walk with God. See you next time.